Hi everybody, I'm Lindsay, one of the team members at Autism Network Scotland and today I'm delighted to be joined by Kath Purdy and Susan Chambers from PASDA. Um, I will let them introduce themselves in a second. As you may know from some of our social media posts, uh, Autism Network Scotland is doing a piece of work looking at autism and ageing and trying to increase knowledge and understanding around this important and under-researched topic. So today we are wanting to talk about things from the point of view of parents and carers, which is why I'm so happy that we've got Kath and Susan here. So, um, Kath, can I start with you just to get you to introduce yourself? Certainly. Hello, Lindsay. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this meeting today on a very relevant topic and very overlooked topic. So I'm looking forward to the discussion immensely. Um, so yeah, I'm Kath Purdy. I'm the Carer Communication Officer at PASDA. Um, I also uh, support my son who is 29 and lives with me at home. He's on the autistic spectrum as well. Thanks, Kath. Susan, can I get you to introduce yourself? I am uh, Susan Chambers. I'm the convener for PASDA and I have been for uh, a number of years. And uh, when we originally set up in the 1990s, I was around in the background. And uh, so I've been involved for over 20 years. I have uh, two daughters, one of whom has um, is autistic and many other neurological related things. And I'm also pretty convinced um, that my mother was autistic because as we all know, it's inherited and several friends. I mean, it's for an undiagnosed mostly, but uh, it's pretty obvious uh, when you know, when you see the characteristics every day. Brilliant, thanks. Thanks both. Okay, so I'm just, I've got a few questions that, um, I'm going to run through with you. So um, I'll start with, can you share some of the experiences um, of parents of older autistic adults? Kath, can we start with you? Yeah, so I, I, I suppose really there will be lots of individual stories. Pasta has quite a big membership and and we try to treat every individual carer as that, as an individual and listen to their stories and the challenges that they, they have individually. Um, I, I suppose the first question on everybody's lips uh, when they have um, an older autistic family member um, will be, who is going to support my family member when I am no longer here? Or, or I am no longer fit to look after them. Because obviously, if you're talking about older autistic individuals who might be in their 50s, 60s, then you, the carer is going to be sort of plus 80. And we do have a number of carers on our books at PASDAS who have that particular you know, age, age group to, to look after. Um, some of the, the stories that they come up, there's a lot of stories on, um, I, I can tell you one gentleman carer that we have who was very concerned about his son retiring because his son had had um, a job at the post office for years and years and he loved his job and he didn't really want to retire because of the routine and he was expected. And uh, uh, when he retired, he, he, he stayed with his, his his father and his father's in his 80s now and he found it really difficult to come up with new solutions and, and new hobbies and interests for his son to to cope with so that that was quite a big um issue um uh a lot of our, our families have came to pass in a last ditch attempt to try and get diagnoses for their family members as well not everybody is diagnosed as a child or a young person. Some people can uh, meander through life being misdiagnosed or maybe diagnosed with mental health issues. And when you finally do get diagnosed at, at a later age, it's quite a big thing to get your head around. You know, some of our, our, my autistic friends have said it's quite a big thing, you know, and you have to process that in your, in your mind that, Yes, you're autistic, and some well, some say 
yeah, that's good. I've got a diagnosis. I know why I did this. I know why I did that. But it's still a big challenge. And it's also a big challenge for, for the families as well, coping with, with a new, when we're that little bit older. And um, we try to um, give a lot of practical help and support to the carers because quite often they, they, they are unaware of all what it takes to be um, how it takes you to look after an autistic individual. So we do lots of training with them. We've got a lot of e-modules that we, we help and support them just to give them the knowledge to make um, caring easier for them and also for to be able to communicate better with their family member as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Kath. Um, Susan, can you share some of your experiences of parents of older autistic adults? Yeah, well, obviously, obviously, they're very similar to Kath. But on the same vein, I thought one of the common issues that comes up, of course, is what will happen to my son or daughter when, they, when I die? Mm -hmm. And I would have said at the beginning, 20 years ago, that is why people came to Pasta. They wanted to know what support was available for their son or daughter. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, there was nothing and there still is no real recognition of what to do and that is a very very sad position to be in and I know I've heard it many times at hundreds of meetings that we've been to of anybody in the third sector and so anybody involved with service um, social services they all say all parents say that of disabled children they all say it so it's a very common a bit of knowledge but there is, as far as I know, no answer yet. So I'm, I'm very pleased that you're doing this piece of work because it's something that quite seriously needs to be planned for. On a specific example, we had a member in the beginning who knew that she was ill. Um, she was in her 50s, I would say, and her son uh, was diagnosed and he was living semi-independently, but she died. And she was very fortunate because she had family members, other family members who virtually adopted him. Uh, that was unusual because we had other uh, parents who joined, uh, older, older, much older women uh, who died. I can't remember, I think it was a heart attack and uh, no other family members in the country. And really the contact was lost with her much older daughter. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's nothing new. People die, <laughs> their older children are left and abandoned in effect. And my cons and the reason why I'm very, very interested in this research is because if these older adults are not looked after, they become an immense problem, immense problem for the health service and for society as a whole. And I'm sure we could look back and think, well, what used to happen to them 50 years ago, 70 years ago, what happened? Oh, I think the death rate, the, the, the suicide rate was incredibly high, I imagine. Alcoholism was incredibly high. And that again is another another issue that we come across, not necessarily 50 plus, but just throughout as people become older, when they're lonely, they start drinking or gambling or taking drugs. And now, nowadays, you know, in the last 30 years, people can go on the internet, gambling, finding a partner. And that again, that was something that came up oh, 20 years ago with another older, another older parent, another older mum who was looking after her son on her own. And uh, she, she was always paying debts for him because he was gambling online. And it was his only comfort. So we look, we know that these are problems in society today, gambling, drug addiction, alcohol, whatever we want to call it, they're there. And we're not really looking at what is behind it. Yes, some people are reckless, but a lot of it is filling a void. And the other, the other issue, the same, the same woman, I mean, it was very sad, but 
Her son also found a partner online and he was getting involved in all kinds of relationships. A lot of the, the girls, the women were special needs and uh, babies were born and nobody to look after them. And again, we know about that. We know that that is a problem that a lot of people can't look after babies or, or understand the consequences. They had to go through DNA tests to prove it was his, etc. So it was, and then he had to pay maintenance. So these are these are compound problems that don't go away, mm. um, but, and they're prevalent throughout society. But I think probably I don't know, and this is why I was asking about the research. Who will collect this data and look into it? But the probability is the numbers are very high mm. for autistic people when they're diagnosed but of course if you don't diagnose them you don't know yeah absolutely and I think that actually that kind of feeds nicely Susan into the next question which is what do you think are the main challenges of parents of older autistic adults so you've kind of you've you've highlighted some but can you maybe expand on some of the challenges for parents the main Challenges, if, I mean, we're here to summarize. I don't want to give too many specific examples, otherwise it would take days. The main challenge, I would say the characteristics of family members that we've had over 20 years or more is anxiety. Now, we've all heard now about anxiety because of the pandemic, but it's nothing new with our family members. And I'm sure nearly everybody in the population will know of a colleague or family member or workmate or whatever, who they say, oh my God, they're so anxious. They're always so nervous. They're always a worrier. I remember my dad coming out with the phrase, you know, it, they'll find something to worry about even if there's nothing. So anxiety is always there, but in our family members, it is constant and it is high and it is every single day every single day it is there and there is nothing you can do until you offer reassurance and you reduce the anxiety because when you're anxious and you know when i say this that it's high when you're anxious and i i can i it brought it back to me the other week because i was driving somewhere and i got lost and then the anxiety starts. Oh, my God, where am I going? How am I going to get out of this? You know, and you find that you can't turn right, you can't turn left, you know, you're on the motorway, whatever. And, you're st and the anxiety is building. Well, at that moment, you're not going to listen to very much. You know, the radio was on, so I had to switch it off because I thought, no, I've got to concentrate. I've got to concentrate what I'm doing here. And so that anxiety is building. And you really cannot listen to any other information until that anxiety is reduced. And I, I don't know because I'm not a medic or trained, but I imagine the anxiety in our family members is very high all the time. And the people that I know well, oh, the bell's gone, sorry. The people that I know well, and the people um, that we've met over the years, that Kath and I have met over the years, you can't have a conversation until you reduce the anxiety. So the main challenge is to do that. Now, it takes time. It doesn't happen in five minutes, but you have to be aware of it and you have to keep doing it. And you have to keep, you have to keep thinking, what is, the real, what is this question here? What is this real question? And then when you dig a bit, you find that it's anxiety, the anxiety about the not knowing, the unpredictable. And when you actually, it's nothing to worry about, you know, that, that, but it's no good saying, don't worry. It's like somebody said, relax, because you can't if you, so you have to say, no, it's not important, or this is what will happen, and this is what it means. You have to keep explaining. And so the main challenges are this communication, mm -hmm. this constant communication, and the planning. The other major issue that we find is that our autistic family members cannot plan. They cannot organize. Now, it's masked, it's masked a lot by um, their ability to speak 
I mean, at one end of the scale, we're not talking about people who are nonverbal. We're talking about people who can speak. We can talk about people who can drive, who can wash up, who can do certain tasks, who can maybe be very good at arithmetic or not. But they can look clean themselves to a certain extent. But the planning and organizing of it is, is a strange thing. It's very, very hard. And they mask it by either making excuses or not doing it or saying they don't like something or being late. And it's, it's all pervasive, all pervasive. So everything is difficult. And the, the idea of, my, in my own case, my, my daughter, and I'm thinking now about my mum, of paying a utility bill or dealing with a, a, a letter in a brown envelope from the DWP or the local authority or whatever. And they have no concept of what to do with that. They don't seem to understand processes. Okay, it's step one, it's step two, it's step three, and then you pay the bill. It isn't like that. That is beyond most of, not all, obviously, because some people are, are very capable, but that is um, a trigger for anxiety. And so it doesn't happen. Anything that makes them anxious, they're not going to do it. So in another case, if you know, if you ask someone to put on clothes that they don't like, that are itchy, they're not going to do it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, then the other thing, I've, I'm looking at some of my notes here about it. And the other issue with planning and, and anxiety, they may be able to tell the time, like they may know it's 10 past two or quarter to three. But what they don't know is if they've got a bus to catch at three o'clock, they need to leave the house at half, past three, at half past two. And before that, they need to be ready. So you have to allow that time working backwards. That is incomprehensible to many. Mm -hmm. And so that's building up that not being able to do appointments, not being able to manage that, the anxiety. Trying to get to a GP appointment is, it becomes an epic event and they're not going to do it on their own and they need support to do that. So all the time, the challenge I would say for and myself and other, other family members that we look at is you can never rest. I don't know if, if you've got young children, but when you have children at school or young children, you're all planning, you think, okay, well, it's Tuesday, so they need their gym kit. Oh, it's Wednesday. They've got the after school club or the, or the Cubs or the Brownies or they're dancing. So we've got to get that kit ready. Oh, well, I'll have three people for dinner. So we'll have to get this ready. And um, well, they're having their friends around. So we better plan for that. And oh, and by the way, I've got to go to work in between and do the shopping. But you are all the time aware of their lives and what they need to do. And when you have an autistic older adult, you're still doing it. You're still, our family members are still doing it at 80. Mm. They are still planning. They are still thinking this person needs to know how to pay a bill. This person needs. So they're still doing that every day. Mm. Maybe not in the house, but remotely or in some way they are doing it. And it's, it's exhausting because you've got your own life but you're also still planning. If you could imagine, you think you're going to do that until they're 18 and then whiff, off they go, off they go. You know, life's out there. Um, they can fit in. It, it's always bumpy at the beginning, but they'll manage. But when you're still doing that for an adult at 50 and 60 years old, that's exhausting. That is really difficult, but they're doing it. All our family, all our carers, that is what they are doing. And just to br briefly, the, the effect that has on the older person with autism, because I'm sure I'm not the only one, but many parents say, what you have to learn how to do this because I won't always be here. Well, that puts the fear of God into them. Mm. As it would anybody. You know, if my parents had said that to me when I was 12, I would have been very frightened. Yeah. I wouldn't know what to do because you can't imagine a life without them.
but you don't kind you kind of don't like it you know when you're 40 or 50 you don't like it that your parents might die but you kind of come to terms that it's inevitable mm-hmm. and you can manage at some way at some level you might autistic adults can't do that so that so so they're, they're in fear all the time but that they are also I'll, I'll let go <laughs> but the other difficulty, the other enormous challenge is their loneliness and isolation. They have no friends because the nature of autism, they find it difficult. And by the time they get 50, 40, 30, 40, 50, and they have no friend, you are their only friend. You are their whole social life, but they don't want you because they know that that's not normal to have your parents as your friend or your brothers and sisters as your friend. So they don't want it, but they don't have any choice. So they then become very isolated and very lonely. And for parents watching sons and daughters be isolated and become more withdrawn and their mental health gets worse, that is very, very difficult, very, very difficult to watch. Mm. So I think they're the major challenges. I mean, maybe... I'll stop there and then Kath get a word in edgeways. Thanks, Susan. Kath, yeah, do you want to add into anything around the challenges and then also if you want to start talking about what can we do to remove some of these challenges as well? Sure, yeah. Well, I think Susan has really covered all the main points that that I had that I was going to, to mention, that the fact that it's... Um, Parents are just coping with living their lives every day the same way, and it's perpetual. You're on a treadmill, as Susan mentioned, and it's very difficult to get off that treadmill, not for every individual, but for the vast majority in our organisation. We found it really, really challenging. Um, Many of our carers, when they're getting older, are still having to, as Susan said, you know, if the parent, if the person doesn't live with them, they're having to go to their house to maybe help with doing their housework, um, helping to pay their bills, look after them financially. Uh, I mean, I know a lot of carers who have joint bank accounts. They've gone to their bank and they've had to have you know both names on the bank accounts to be able to help them do their banking, um, making medical health appointments. You know. Um, it's really an endless list and they're all just the practical things and as Susan's said as well it's all the emotional support that you give an individual because you can't just sit down with somebody and give a wee pep talk for a couple of minutes it can take hours sometimes absolute hours so it does take a lot of time so in the end, when you, and, and as I say, a lot of our older carers, they find that they still don't have a life. You know, they, they, there is no such thing as planning for that retirement, you know, as you would normally if you had a, a non-autistic individual in your life. There's no planning for that. So it's, it's really, really difficult. How, how we get through to uh, the powers that be I'm not sure because, you know, PAS did do a lot of campaigning as an organisation on behalf of our carers and their family members. And, you know, they'll remain nameless, but I can't count on the number of one time that that I've spoken to politicians at the Scottish Parliament who say, really, there's a problem? We, We don't think there's a problem with all these people. And, and it's because of the fact that the carers are doing the work and they're not getting credit for it. You know, they're the ones that, that are making sure that their lives run like clockwork all the time. And, and of course, uh, um, it's only when a carer dies or becomes too elderly to look after them, then the state has this person to look after. And I suppose going to the autistic individual, I suppose, and as Susan touched upon it as well, it's the incredible feelings of loneliness and isolation that a lot of autistic individuals get because they have but they have found it difficult to make social interactions in the past. Not all, but some find it really difficult. Um, and so that's a, that's a big worry for, for parents and carers as well, thinking, 
what's going to happen to my child you know when when you know i have gone or i can't look after them so um i would like to bring up the the big topic of training because i think training and, and autism awareness training is so important to everybody that comes into contact with their family members and their carers whether it be local authorities or social work or um, health boards, medical professions, emergency services, you know, anybody who comes in, it, it, it would be make up our life as carers so much easier if, if these organisations had a little bit of understanding of what carers do. Um, it, it's, it's, Carers, carers are, are experts by experience, a lot of them, because they know what makes their person tick. They, they've often lived with them for a, a long, long time, and they know what the triggers are for that individual. They know what, what makes them tick. And, and, and quite often, you, you know, you hear a lot about person-centred approach, and it doesn't always work for autistic individuals. You know, that might seem a little bit controversial, but... When I, whenever I have I, I go to, to meetings and I'm dealing with a carer and trying to get some support for their older family member, I say, well, listen to the carer. They know their person best, you know, uh, uh, and maybe they can come up with some good strategies or options yourself. So, you know, I I, I often think that 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 there is a lot still to be done. We've made a start, and you know, and, and organisations can and and statutory or organisation I never understood why they didn't talk to each other <laughs> you know that was the big thing for me they all worked in their individual silos mm -hmm. and that made, makes caring for an older autistic individual well because you're having to talk from A person to B person to C person and you're telling them all the same thing where if they you know if there was a way of making life easier to share information it would just make the life of the carer easier and it would help with the anxiety of the autistic individual as well, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kath. Susan, is there anything you would add to what we can do to remove some of the challenges? Yeah, I, if there is, I mean, I've, everything that Kath said is, is obvious and we've known for over 20 years, you know, 30 years. I would say the, the thing that could, the most important thing to, um, remove the challenges is to stop being in denial. Now, by that I mean the level of support and the way that many families are spoken to is it can't possibly be that bad, mm. or you must be exaggerating, or the classical, well, you know. Um, all, all teenagers behave like that when they're teenagers. But of course, as they get older, they're still behaving like that because they don't want to be with you. You know, so what happens is you build up an internal family conflict because they don't want to be there and the older adults don't really want them there because they know they should be out on their own. So there's an internal conflict. So when an outside organization comes in and looks, they see conflict and they see the parents, carers, whatever we want to call them, as the problem. So the denial is, the denial is constant. And I would have said many, many of our families have lost faith, trust, whatever you want to call it, in statutory services because they have caused them so much pain by making them believe that it is their fault. Mm -hmm. So we've got 80 year olds who still believe it's their fault that their son or daughter is behaving in the way that they are because mm -hmm. no one has ever told them or helped them explain how to behave differently, how to do this mm -hmm. differently and how to understand the basic concept of autism so that, I mean, they understand that this, their family member is having difficulty, but it's the how do you do anything? So there's usually reached a truce where people are jogging along quite well until there may be a crisis like the pandemic. 
But on the whole, there is conflict and an outside organization will only see the parents as the problem. And so when Kath says, you know, it's the statutory organizations need a bit of training, I think there's a lot of training and understanding of how the parents and carers are really trying their best, they are, but unless they have support and understanding, nothing will happen mm -hmm. and it will only get worse. And then when they die, of course, it is worse. Mm -hmm. I can give you an example from my own experience when my, my daughter was in her early twenties and she met a guy and she was desperate and he said she was beautiful. So she met and, and moved in and lived with him after three weeks. Well, he'd been living on the streets so it was a very difficult situation for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't remember why at the time, but social work, um, I think they were either involved with him or we'd had a support worker for our daughter. And we wanted her to have a lot of support. And we were obviously concerned what would happen if she got pregnant. And their answer was, it was none of my business. It was none of my business. She was an adult and she could do what she liked. And basically I was to leave them alone. Okay, you know, okay, uh -huh. that's quite hard to take. Yeah. Okay, so what happens when she gets pregnant? Um, who would look after the baby? We would. Well, no, she'll get benefits. Yeah. That, that was the answer. So we were the problem. We were told yeah. to back off and mind our own business. Now, for the next 20 years, we've been told the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it becomes quite hard. You're, you're in a constant d dilemma. And they can give you many, many other examples like that. I mean, more recently, I have a friend who in her 60s, she was an alcoholic. And now I look back, she was an alcoholic because she was depressed. She was depressed because she's pretty clearly, I mean, it's almost like, She's got those Rudolf Antlers on, you know, I am Asperger's, I am autistic. It's so obvious now, I now I know. And when I went to the GP with her many times and tried to explain in a subtle way to the GP, I think there's underlying issues here. Again, who are you? You know, you're nobody, you're nobody. You know, we've just got an alcoholic sitting here. Yeah. And they don't, so nobody's listening. So that's what I mean by the denial. Mm -hmm. so when you're trying to, I mean, I, I could understand it. Professionals don't like being told by non-professionals. Have you thought about this? Have you missed that? They don't like it. But I think we've got to grow up a bit. And as Kath said, except that often the family members know the behavior and the likes, the dislikes, but they don't, and they're not evil, but they just don't know what to, what to do. Yeah. And of course, many of these families who don't know what to do don't want their son or daughter at home, so they're out. But where do they go? Yeah, absolutely. Who would have them? Nobody yeah. would have them. And I guess that then follows again nicely into the next question, which is about the importance of including autistic people and their parents in research and in policy work. Um, so, Kath, again, I'll, I'll come to you with that one first. Mm -hmm. What are your views on the importance of including autistic people and parents and carers in that work? Yeah, I think it's very important that we get some research, both for um, older autistic adults and their families. It's very important. Um, there are, over the years... Um, since autism has really been in the headlines, which is little, really from the 1970s, which was the big explosion in interest uh, um, with autism, with Lorna Wing, etc. Um, a lot of the research has been relevant for children. Mm -hmm. And there has been hardly anything, of whatever subject you talk about, communication or sleep or anything, it's all children all the time. And you know, if you if you, you autism is a lifelong condition, and you know, it it doesn't miraculously disappear when you're sixteen or eighteen. You know, and I think a lot of people think that when they've gone through school and they're 
thrust into the big wide world that, that, that they sh should be able to cope. So, yes, getting some data and be able to have some evaluation would be very, very important to have that information to hand. Um, for me, though, that, that, that there, there should be funding available as well and dedicated to supporting the family as a whole. I think that is just so important because, you know, as I say that again, there's, there's, I know we've digressed a little bit from research, but funding is so important as well as, as the research because, you know, again, there's, a, there's quite a lot of funding, as Susan has mentioned, for children's services and up to a certain age in adults. But, you know, you try getting anything for anybody who is like an autistic individual who's 50 or over, I mean, I know how difficult it is trying to get support services um, for some of my carers, for their, for their family members with, with counselling and benefits, et cetera. There's lots of things that, that, that they, they can't access and it's just so difficult. So, um, yeah, I, I look forward to, to receiving that, that research and, and, and seeing what it can tell us. And I, I don't think it'll be a very happy story when it finally gets put out there. Yeah. Should, should anything you would add to that? Um, yeah, the, the carers, and it isn't always parents, sometimes it's siblings, mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's grandparents, but yeah, I mean, it's a no-brainer. I mean, uh, over the years, over the last 20 years, nearly all organisations, disability organisations, gay rights, um, black and ethnic minorities, there's no point in having a discussion without them. So why would we ever consider having a discussion of autism without the autistic person? But also, we're talking here a fundamental problem. You wouldn't, you, you, you might be having um, a consultation about deaf people and the, the hearing community and how they integrate the hearing community, you wouldn't dream of not having someone there who was signing, but on the uh, but you'd still have the deaf person there, but you would have signing. So here, when we're talking about, you need the family members because they need to interpret. And I know that we're, we're both aware of, men, of Kath and I have many, many meetings we've been to over the years where autistic people are included and they are fantastic, you know, it makes such a difference, the cross-party groups, cons ANS consultations, conferences, etc. But the people that are invited that are autistic are very, very capable and very um, confident and assured, or they appear to be on the surface, but they, they can express themselves and um, they're the minority. And good luck to them, you know, good luck, because they've struggled. But in our experience, for Kath and I, obvious, we haven't met them. Our family members are not these very confident, capable people. Our family members are the ones at home who don't like going speaking in public, mm -hmm. who are not confident in that way and just or wouldn't be capable of doing anything that they're talking about. So they need a voice as well. Mm -hmm. And while I appreciate, yeah, the autistic, we can't speak for them, but we can give a different perspective on what it is because they're not all. I mean, how many of us in society, in our normal lives, have met people that we'd say, you know, they're a really brilliant public speaker and they've done fantastic things. Let's put them on that stage and talk about it. I'm 70, I may have met two people in my life like that. So it isn't, it isn't in, the, in the neurotypical world, you commonly find people that are brilliant. And yet in the autistic world, it seems to be that all these autistic adults, given the chance they'd be out there on the platform talking, and they don't need their mum or dad or brother or sister to interpret for them. But, you know, they're not the ones on the, the rest of them are at home or suffering in, in, in silence, in isolation. So, yeah, of course, we need to include them, but also 
you need to have a perspective of the carers that are doing most of the work. Can I just go back? I know, I know it's difficult editing, but back with you, when you were asking what could we do to remove the challenges apart from the, um, the not denial and, and training. The thing, the difficulty is the level of support that, that they require is constant, pervasive, every day. For each autistic adult or person need somebody they can trust. It doesn't have to be their parents. It could be the GP, the CPM, the community practice, the psychologist, um, anybody in a role or counsellor, somebody like that, that they can go to when they find that it's very difficult, life is difficult, and they don't understand. Because they need to practice that. But at the moment, in many areas, they don't exist. Yeah. I mean, my GP doesn't really know, Emily, because our old GP surgery closed. So we've got a new GP. So but there has to be something, and there is no CPN service. There isn't, uh, in the area we live, there isn't one. I mean, that's absurd. And a psychologist, the waiting list is two years. And then it's only six weeks or Maybe, you know, you might be granted a bit more. That's abysmal. That is utterly shameful in our society. Because we've known, as Kath said, about autism since the 1970s. Mm -hmm. I remember going to the ANS meetings before they were called ANS. They were called SAN, Scottish Autistic Network, when we were meeting in the 90s. And we were talking about this. So we'd known about it. And we've known what we wanted for over 20 years. And still, there's a two-year waiting list for a psychologist. So there's no training has taken place, or minimal. The other thing that autistic adults need when the families are not here is they need somebody to talk to every day. If you're lonely and isolated, you need someone to talk to you need someone to say, have you written that letter yet? Have you unloaded the dishwasher? Have you done, done your shopping? Have, what time is your appointment? What's in your diary today? You know, they all need that management, that, that planning, the organizational management, obviously in a friendly, nice way, not in a nagging, um, difficult way, but they need that because otherwise they, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. And the third major thing that most families need is somebody to help with the so being sociable, whatever that may mean for them. But it's a fundamental human desire to connect, to communicate, and they can't do it. Not easily anyway, not without a lot of support. So I, I, I remember my mother when she was in a care, not a care home, but supported accommodation, mm -hmm. 50 plus. And uh, we moved her there when she was 80. And it was everybody else's job to be sociable, but not hers. Mm. But she wanted something to be sociable every day. You know, card games or painting classes, whatever it was. But it was always somebody else's job. <clears throat> it wasn't hers. And that's very common, very, very common. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Susan. Um, well, I guess a question to both of you, is there anything else um, that you would like to say or anything that, that you feel we've missed out of the discussion, Kath? Anything else that you would like to add? Um, no, I think, I think we've covered everything that, that I wanted to to get across, um, uh, 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 as I say, the main thing was that how much work that the carers do at, at, at a time when they should be able to have some time for themselves, you know, at that age group, and they're still having to support their family members because of the fact that there are so few appropriate services out there for them. And, and uh, you know, over the years, when I've been I've been involved in, I know that things are changing. You know, little by little, things are starting to uh, drip feed and get a little better. But 
you know, we, we needn't be complacent because there's still so far to go. And, and especially with this piece of work that, that is being done by the network and yourself, Lindsay, it's, it's so important that um, we get some information on how we can support older adults and their families to make life better for them all. Thanks. Yeah. Susan, is there anything else that you'd like to add? I think I want to just reiterate something Kath said earlier. Really, I don't know that we want any more strategy, policy, framework, mapping. What families want is action. Mm -hmm. And really, I suppose what I want to know is how much further this research will go. Because you can do, research is lovely. I mean, I love doing it myself. It can go on forever. Mm -hmm. But what families want is delivery. They want the trained psychologists, support worker, whatever we want to call them. Mm -hmm. and GPs to know what we're talking about and as Kath mentioned earlier the interface between our families and the so-called help it, it's got to happen it has got to change yeah, yeah absolutely and I and think it, you know I these nurtures all how well you make it change is yeah, absolutely. And and research is all well and good, but I, I think that research, for me, research really only has value if it then has a practical impl implication afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. and, well, we and, seem to be in stasis about it. Yeah. Everybody's talking the right talk, but we don't want talk. We want action. We want action. We want people to walk the talk, really. That, yeah. <laughs> that's all. Absolutely. We know what to do. We know what, I mean, all the things I said about psychologists, someone to speak to them, GPs, you know, sexual health clinics, whatever it is. We all, we've said it. Everybody knows that, but nobody's doing it. Or yeah. not that we know of. We don't know where it's happening, but it isn't happening where we are. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's happening in some far off planet, but it isn't happening in the Lothians. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you both very much for joining me today. It's been great to talk to you and um, hopefully you can continue to be involved in this piece of work as we move forward. So I'm, I'll just say um, thank you to Kath and to Susan for joining me today. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lindsay. It's been great. I just want to put on record um, a big vote of thanks to all the carers who helped uh, formulate my thinking for today's meeting and some autistic individuals as well. Without them, I wouldn't have been able to get my points across. So thanks to them. Yeah, that's true. That's very good, Kath. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you both.